Welcome to Positive Filter with your host, Fuller Wilkerson, a podcast that focuses on friends, family, health, and career with a little self-help along the way. Please join me in this journey for self-improvement, and I hope what I have to share will make you a better person, thus making the world a better place. I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It's Philip Wilkerson back with another episode of Positive Filter. I'm joined by a special guest. Well, everyone's a special guest because they take their time to join me on my show. I'm joined by Miss Sammy Walker Herrera. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I'm really working on my pronunciation of names. But I've met uh, this amazing higher ed uh, leader, speaker, innovator, LinkedIn guru, brand person (laughs) on LinkedIn, actually, and followed a few of her workshops, jumped in and really made a connection with her uh, via the internet. And I was like, wow, I know she's got something that she can share with my listeners. And so um, before we get into this, uh, Sammy, why don't you give the uh, listeners a little bit of background on who you are and we'll get into the topic today. Absolutely. Again, thank you so much, Phil, for the invitation. It's really exciting to make our online connection slightly more developed, right? Being able to be on your podcast, connect, and maybe in the future we can connect in person as well. Oh, excellent. And so, you know, take us, I think what, um, there's this this new term, like a higher ed expat or Mm -hmm. higher ed, uh, higher ed, uh, I don't want to say refugee, but you know what I meant? Like Mm -hmm. you left the world of higher ed. So can you take us through that journey, like your educational journey? And then now that you're now an entrepreneur, tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Sammy Walker Herrera, and I am a higher education student affairs expat. I originally studied in undergrad at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, where I'm currently now based again, in psychology and Hispanic studies. And when I started those majors, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do with them. But I knew that I wanted those bases, those core bases of information those philosophies about how to interact with people and how to make meaning in the world as the base for how I would grow my future career. Since my time at Carnegie Mellon, I graduated from my master's at Slippery Rock University in student affairs and higher education. So I do have a student affairs higher education degree where my focus there was on multicultural development and Even in my time at Carnegie Mellon, I spent a lot of time in career coaching, career counseling as well. My time in higher education was at a small liberal arts college at the University of Florida. So you can tell very different institutional types right there, working in diversity inclusion, working in career coaching again. And in my time in higher education, recognizing A, not only that lack of opportunity for advancement that often happens once you get to like a coach level, for example, often that lack of advancement might be, okay, maybe I can be an associate, maybe a director, but what then? For example, I know for a while I was actually pretty interested in a doctorate of some sort, probably in human development and some type of education. But I realized in my time as a career coach, working specifically with students that this is actually something that I love to do. However, how can I do that in an environment that is a bit more flexible for me, where I feel like I'm able to direct my voice a lot more, make more decisions about how I coach, who I work with, how I can support them, how I can build out programs. And so that's why entrepreneurship really stuck out to me. So I actually met another person on the internet, on LinkedIn, named Yasser Khan, who I signed up with for business coaching and sales training as well. And it was so interesting to me how my counseling courses in my master's program really set me up in the right direction to be someone who is good at sales. Because there's so much where it takes asking good questions, recapping what someone said, getting to the core issue or the core challenge that someone is navigating and why they're deciding to go for a coach or buy a certain project to help them with that specific challenge. And so working with him, I realized, you know what, this is something that I really want to be able to do. I also freelance through with a career coaching startup as well. So I was like, okay, let me test out a little bit more the startup, the more the remote full-time life. And now Yasser and I are working together. We both co-founded the Speaking Academy through Yasser Khan Coaching. And we work with corporate technology professionals. So folks usually in the C-suite from companies such as Snapchat or Snap, 
Facebook, Twitter, Interpol, University, um, Oxford University, for example. And we really work with them to make sure they're polishing their speaking. They're able to speak on the spot without fear and even get to that next level and, pre and host prepared presentations. I love that. So one of my thoughts that already comes to my mind was one, you were talking about flexibility. Uh, mm -hmm. Were you an innovator? Did you do this transition before the pandemic? Like, did you catch the wave about being flexible before the pandemic? Or did you make this shift in the past two years? This has been within the last two years. So I actually moved to Gainesville, Florida and started working at the University of Florida in March 2020. And I worked there for about a year and a half or so. And about maybe six months or eight months into my experience, I realized, wow, I've really learned a lot, but I'm not exactly sh I feel like I am plateauing. Like I want to learn a little bit more. What are other skills that I can build to make sure I'm helping even more people and I'm able to go a lot more in depth? One thing I recognized from my time as a career coach was, and when I had the numbers in front of me, I was completely astounded. Most of the students I had worked with, I had only seen once. Mm. Maybe I had about 15 or so students that I'd seen more than once. And I think three of them I saw four times, right? So I wasn't able to build these deep relationships with students and really get to understand their long-term challenges and how they develop. It was very rare that someone felt the need to come back multiple times. And honestly, a lot of the times that we did bring in students, it was related to a classroom assignment, right? Or specific homework that they had to do. And the hope was, oh, if we bring them in once, they'll see how amazing our services are. They're going to see how amazing our coaches are. And we are amazing. And the services are top notch for sure. University of Florida is the number two career center by best colleges when I was working there. But it, that wasn't enough of a pull for students to feel like they're building relationships with us. Right. And that was something that was that was hard for me and hard for me just because of the style of work that I like to do. I like to build deeper relationships with my clients. I like to get a sense of where they started, where they're going now, what their goals are. If I see something related to something that could be supportive for them. So for example, an exercise that would be helpful for them to build their assertiveness when they're asked impromptu questions at work. I love having those at the ready. So when I see them in our group coaching calls, I can say, hey, I thought of you. Let's try this out. Let's see how we can build this skill together. I love that. I love the rapport building. And I like wrote that down like 15 plus. And now you're going to have me go down the rabbit mm -hmm. hole and see how many repeats I have. Mm -hmm. I, that is a very true statement. Like, you know, you know, they come in one stop shop, help me with my resume. And you're like, wow, this is a deeper issue than just your resume. But then but before you know, it's the end of the semester and you only to work once or twice. And so that's a very powerful statement. So I'm gonna get right into the, the meat of this conversation about public speaking, because I think that one, I've seen you present multiple times. So you're a wonderful public speaker, your wonderful presentation skills and all that. So one, before we go into this as a thing that you teach others, I wanna learn a little bit more about your journey. So mm -hmm. take us through your journey about you building confidence or you being a public speaker or actually practicing or anything like that. Take us to that, you know, day one and how you hone that craft for yourself. Yes. I would say the first day I truly considered myself a leader was the day that I was elected to be vice president of philanthropy in my sorority when I was an undergrad. And that was in my freshman year or my first year. I've left higher education for long enough. I said freshman. Anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> from that experience, I realized, wow, I have such an opportunity to make so much positive change. So the sorority I was a part of was a national sorority called Alpha Chi Omega. And the philanthropy, the national philanthropy that we champion is domestic violence awareness, which is something that is close to my heart and very close to a lot of my sisters of the chapter at Carnegie Mellon. And one thing I realized when I would get in front of the chapter and try to get them excited about an event that I'm hosting. Oh, we're doing a salsa dancing event, or we're, we're donating money, or we're hosting a walk a mile event, where we're getting professors and staff members wearing high heels across campus to show awareness and build fun, was that be it, it being such a heavy topic, and it and philanthropy being so, philanthropy and volunteer organization being so much work, 
I remember actively at the age of 17, 18, telling a lot of jokes and trying to, and being very silly in front of the chapter to get their attention, right? Never jokes about the subject matter, but just things to lighten the mood um, and then let them know toward the end of my time in front of them about what we were doing. And I realized after a little bit, I didn't have more volunteers for my events. I realized we didn't have folks helping put up more posters or paint the fence or per, or invite their friends to donate or support our events. And I realized just because I feel comfortable being more myself, authentic, maybe silly in front of the chapter, doesn't mean that I'm making the impact that I intended to make. And that struck me for a bit. I was like, wow, like, I don't want to just, I don't want to leave this role that has so much impact, not only for awareness at Carnegie Mellon, but also support for educational programs and support for women at the Women's Center here in Pittsburgh. I realized that I need to make sure that I'm taking myself seriously and that I truly see myself as a leader so I can convey that from the inside out and that anytime that I speak, there's a call to action and there's impact that comes from there where we, because I spoke and because I highlighted my own passion, maybe my own story in some ways, that more people were motivated to provide that support. And I think I developed a lot more of my public speaking experience and even that inner confidence from working at the Career and Professional Development Center at CMU, because I was just so bought into when we start building your resume, your LinkedIn, it's more than a resume. Just like you said, it's that sense of feeling like I have more direction and clarity of what I want to do. Yes, I'm a sophomore undergraduate student studying psychology, but I at least know there's a few different options for me in academia, in corporate, internships I can look at. And you feel more confident about what you're studying and it gets you more excited about the future as well. Right. And so Often the best salespeople, the best salespeople are the people who have 100% belief in what they're selling. Someone might not have the best strategy or techniques, but when you truly believe in what you're selling or what you are championing in that moment, it provides this energy and confidence that says, hey, I'm talking to you about this because I honestly believe it would be a disservice not to tell you about this. And so I believe those experiences where I wasn't having the impact I wanted to for a cause that was so important to me, but I was having more of an impact and training through student employment, I realized, okay, maybe I can make sure to create more of that change. And so, of course, being a career coach, I probably gave very similar resume presentations a hundred times. <laughs> so I was used to being in front of groups of people predominantly students, but also faculty members, staff members as well. And Phil, you mentioned recognizing me from different webinars that I've hosted. I've hosted maybe three or four solo trainings on LinkedIn related to leaving student affairs and higher education, how to do that, how to level up your resume when you're a graduate student, how to build out your goal setting in the year 2022, things like that. And Honestly, from those experiences, I did a lot of scripting and I did a lot of practicing for my presentation. So a lot of my experience with public speaking was more prepared. And it was only until I started doing more of this public speaking training with Yasser that I was also developing more of my capacity for impromptu speaking in the moment, not judging my answers in the moment, still being polished, still good pace and feeling like I have more of a structure when I speak. I love that. You know, it's funny because uh, you say more confidence when in pop to speaking. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm very heavily involved in Toastmasters. Oh, wow. And so that's literally the same uh, avenue is that the, the confidence wasn't there. I think we're in the same place telling jokes and all that. But mm -hmm. I definitely, I pursue Toastmasters for to be more refined, more polished, more serious. And so I, I think similar to you, you know, in a sim, you have a coach and you had coaching and training. I use like a actual formalized, like 
Toastmasters organization to keep me accountable, in which I believe I've become a little bit more refined and better at public speaking, but at the same time, I have not lost that authentic self, you know? So mm -hmm. I love it. Take us to that. So like you were like coming and you connected with what I, what I, what I believe his name is Yasser. Mm -hmm. right? it. Connecting with Yasser and he is a public speaking you know, expert. How did you like say, hey, I want to join forces with you. And then how did that relationship begin with the actual training of your public speaking skills? Yeah. Well, first, Phil, I just want to say that I love that you've had a similar experience to me. And it's so funny how when we're not as confident, one of the first things we can easily go to are those self-deprecating jokes, right? Like I'm gonna lighten the mood by like showing that I don't care or showing that like mm -hmm. I'm fun or something like that, right? And that can be tricky and you never realize how much of that voice that you're putting out there actually ends up sticking to you, right? And truly impacting your confidence. But when we talk about how Yasser and I connected for public speaking coaching, mm -hmm. the funny thing about that is I did not reach out to him. He reached out to me. <laughs> so it was earlier on, it was probably about May of this past year. And now I think about it, it's May now, so a year ago. Okay. He reached out to me and I was still in his coaching, coaching cohort. And he said, hey, Sammy, I don't have the money and I don't have an idea, but I want to work with you. I know we're going to work together at some point. And I was like, that sounds great. <laughs> I love that. That's very, I like the open invitation. That's fantastic. And at that time, I was still working at the University of Florida, and I actually started working full time for Self Made Millennial, which again was a is a career coaching startup. So I was working there, and it wasn't the best fit for me based on some of my working style, based on some movements with the the organization. And after that experience, I took a bit of a break. It was the first break I'd ever taken in my career. And fun fact, Phil. LinkedIn very recently, probably in the last month or six weeks or so, added a feature to your experience section where you can add a career break of some sort. So for example, maternity, maternity, parental leave, sabbatical, COVID. <laughs> for example. And so it really normalizes the fact that sometimes people need to take a break or want to take a break or life happens. Right. And so life happened to me. I took a bit of a break and Yasser was one of the first people I reached out to. So I actually reached back out to him and I said, hey, remember when you said we would work together? I'm a little bit more curious about how that might work out. And it worked out very well that he had more of an idea. We actually even scrapped that first idea and he really dug deep into himself and he realized, you know what? I've done some public speaking coaching in the past. I am an expert. I've won all these competitions. The reason I'm not a public speaking coach right now is because I'm scared and I don't want to be scared anymore. So let's do this. And he trained me for the exact techniques and the exact exercises that we use with our clients today. Well, hold up. So he said that he would, I just listening real carefully. Yeah. He, you helped him and you helped, he helped you because he was afraid to start a thing. And then you were his part of my life. You were his guinea pig. And so, I mean, by doing that, he was empowered because he was like, I have someone, it's almost like I have someone to pour into and really develop or help. But in a sense, he was getting development too and his confidence of coaching other people or whatever, or, or at least brainstorming ideas. Like this is a new idea. And you were someone that would be, you know, somewhere he could be vulnerable with and, and kind of test that. That's that's a very powerful thing if you think about wow. that in a sense. Like well, I have an idea, but I have a friend to help me develop that idea in a sense that's a win-win. Like I'm gonna help you, but you're helping in actuality, you're helping me too. Yeah, I would say what happened right then and there too was that Yasser and I have a lot of trust built between mm -hmm. each other. By the time that we decided, you know what, we're gonna work together, we had never met in person. We'd known each other for a little bit over a year or so. And I met him on Zoom probably 20 times or so for all different coaching sessions, one-on-one -on -one group, just check-ins and support and things like that. And when he said, hey, I know you and I talked about this one idea, but it's just not going to pan out. The market is not there. People aren't interested. Let I'm, I want to do this. And I said, oh, okay, cool. So how does that change some of the dot, dot, dot? 
there was that trust there where he was like, wow, okay, Sammy is 100% in on what we're doing. I changed the entire business model and she still wanted to work with me on this. And he knew I could do it. I just needed a little bit more of that specific training. And maybe, and hopefully some of that training that he provided for me did build up more of that confidence. Every day, he and I are still building up our confidence in what we're doing. I often like to say to our clients, there's an inner confidence and there's an outer confidence. And oftentimes you are speaking a lot more confidently than you actually believe. Other people might rate you a nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 for a confidence. But if you still believe that you're speaking, is it a five out of 10, four out of 10, and it's really low, your speaking is going to get worse because you're going to practice less because you're less motivated because you feel like you're doing worse than you are. So that's why key mm -hmm. feedback is so important, not only from public speaking experts, but also from the cohort in the group mm -hmm. as well. The group provides all this feedback and support where Yasser and I put our hands up and say, hey, we're not just saying this to say it. Like these folks could have easily been in your audience at work. And they're saying that they believe you were confident when you were speaking. Oh, man, I, I think cohort. You're you're actually selling Toastmasters to me over again because <laughs> and, I, I, and I say that because the inner voice, outer voice and having vulnerable spaces. But like you're talking and other people are like you're practicing with other people. Mm -hmm. and, you're, and you're forcing yourself to do it, you know, forcing yourself. And I never thought about that, you know, like that self-rating versus public rating, because I think a lot of people will assume when they know me, Philip Wilkerson, I'm very extroverted. Mm -hmm. I am at a nine or 10, but also I'm still having a chip on my shoulder um, mm -hmm. and, and that thing. So I'm going to, I'm going to take that as a tip of the days. I'm going to talk to myself like I would talk to someone else and also try to match my outward level to my annual level. I love that. Um, what has been some of your, you know, lessons that you learned for yourself as a speaker over this time? I mean, I know that this is great, like where you, you know, besides the self, I, I heard one a tip that you shouldn't do self-deprecating humor. You know, that mm -hmm. doesn't really help. But what are some other techniques you learned over time? Like, wow, I, I say a lot of ums or uhs, or what are some other things you learned about yourself as a speaker during this time? Yeah. I'll share a little bit more about, as you mentioned, what I've learned. And then I would also love to share with you and whomever is listening a couple of techniques that are super easy to practice at home. These And these are things that we use with our clients as well, right? But the fun thing, the funny thing about that type of accountability, right, in coaching, in Toastmasters, which Yasser was a part of for many years. So we do have kind of that Toastmasters yeah. base as well, which is fantastic, yeah. is the accountability, right? Yeah. You could easily have a personal trainer give you the exact diet plan that you should be on, the exact meals you should be making, the exact workouts you should be doing and how often you're doing them, and ways to track, for example, the rest of the month, like what you'll be eating, what you'll be working on. You People can be handed that, but often they still might not do anything about it, right? Many folks who have more of that success, let's say, again, in that personal training, in that fitness journey, are doing food journals, are taking pictures of what they're eating, are taking pictures or video of them working out and sending it to their coach and saying, I'm here. I was here for an hour and a half. I did what you asked, things like that. So that accountability in both Toastmasters as well as coaching with, with experts, right, or coaching in that group cohort model, a more intensive boot camp model per se, that's what really brings a lot of that change as well. But for me, one thing I've noticed with my own speaking is the funny thing about it is I, when I started working with Yasser, I was pretty confident with my speaking. I didn't know what I could improve. I didn't know what I didn't know because I often didn't rewatch my own speaking engagements. I would often listen to some of my past, let's say, podcast episodes, but I often, when I was on camera, right, where the nerves were a lot more raised for me, I often didn't rewatch those sessions. And I remember the first session Yasser and I hosted together. It was a training in January. I remember right after the training, he said, okay, great job, Sammy. I just do want to let you know you have a lot of ums and uhs, and I need you to like work on that. 
And when he said that, it wasn't to be mean at all. It was just his feedback. It was just what he noticed that I didn't notice at all. And I know I was so embarrassed. I was so embarrassed. Hey, y'all, I'm a public speaking coach and I have all these ums and uhs. So for me, something I learned a lot in general is just there's always things that you can be polishing. That public speaking is a journey. And in that sense, it's very easy to go to one extreme and say, oh my goodness, I'm just never going to be perfect. I'm never going to get better. It doesn't have to be that way. You'll never be perfect no matter what. But because it's a journey, it's something that you can work on. Therefore, it means that you need to have a habit of working on your speaking so that instead of plateauing or going down after time, you can at least maintain or keep increasing your skill. So that's something I've recognized is as much as we ask our clients to practice, I practice my speaking too. I, I practice it. my on-the-spot speaking as well in the exact same manner that I asked them to. And that's actually how I did my coaching as well as a career coach. When I hosted a program called Student Affairs to Elsewhere, and I had clients who were in higher education who wanted to move out of higher education, every single exercise that I created, every single homework that I gave them were things I did ahead of time so that I could share my experience and I knew that it would work well for them. I love that. One one thing I love about that is habits become your being, right? Mm -hmm. So can you, can you take us through some like concrete ways that you practice? Like I say the same thing. Like I, I remember one, one of my frat brothers uh, coached me and was like, okay, record yourself and send it to me. And I was like, mm -hmm. no. And he, and he was like, when I say record yourself, like stand up, Mm -hmm. Face the camera, you you know, speak with your chest, and I, I was like, "This is so awkward." Like I, I was using a webcam, but he had me stand up, and I was I had the videos I uploaded them to YouTube, and mm -hmm. it was cringy. It was it was mad cringy. I think it's still cringy in my mind, but it, it helped me take myself outside of myself and look at my body language, or look at how I'm using my hands and how I'm using the space of the room. You know, am I pacing? Am I swaying? Mm -hmm. And so I am not going to lie and say I do this all the time. Probably because of you, Sammy, I'm probably going to start <laughs> being more thoughtful about watching myself over again and studying. The, like quarterbacks do it all the time. They mm -hmm. they study film and they watch themselves throw. And they don't feel like that's awkward. But other times, I don't know. It feels weird. Like uh, watching yourself public speak is not the same to me as watching yourself dance or watch yourself. Mm -hmm you know, play a sport. Right. But I think the greats do that. They, they do it in every form or fashion. They, if they're lifting weights, they're videoing themselves with the technique. So can you take us through some of that exercises that you do to like turn that into a habit? Yeah. And even what you just said there, right? Like it's super awkward to watch my speaking. What I recommend you do, and this, we, what we do with our clients as well. So anyone listening, feel free to do this as well. We have our clients record a baseline video. This is a video that we use to compare all the rest of their future videos on. So we don't ask our clients to rewatch every single one of their videos, right? Because I do think that would impact folks' confidence in that moment, right? There are some times when, oh, I have a couple of days I was kind of sick, I wasn't able to practice, or you're focusing on one skill, right? We ask our clients to focus on one thing at a time. So perhaps their ums and uh, uhs are gone, but their gestures are still like really weird, right? Or like their, their body is really locked and then they're judging themselves from that. So having a baseline video, is something super helpful because let's say after two weeks, you compare your last video with your baseline video and you can see immense progress just from those two weeks as well. And so with that baseline video, and this is the practice that I do very regularly, almost every day, is I'll get my whole webcam set up. I'll either be sitting kind of like, okay, I'm practicing for speaking on Zoom or speaking on a podcast like this, for example, or standing. Oh, I'm preparing like I'm presenting in person, for example. I try to mimic it as close to what my next speaking engagement is going to be like. I pop open a website. Often what we do is we just encourage our clients to Google random question generator. Pop that in there. You can have it pop one question. You can have it pop five questions at a time. And I love having it have five questions at a time because then your practice is answering those five questions on the spot. 
So one of my favorites that pops up is, tell me about your favorite cloud formation or the weirdest cloud formation you've ever seen. I can imagine that's maybe never a question most people have ever gotten asked. That might not be a question folks are asked at work, for example, but it's a really great out of the box question to really help you get a sense of how can I start answering this, right? Another one, where do I see myself in five years? That is a little bit more like an interview question, right? That might be more of a question that you get, maybe not every single day, but once a year, a couple times a year, things like that. It's a question you've heard people ask. And so with your baseline video, we encourage our clients to record and not stop the recording. Answer those three, four, five questions, because then we see even in between answering the questions, are you shifting around a lot? Are you really nervous? Are you completely solid? Are you like a statue and your face is unmoving? Are you having filler words? And where are those filler words coming in? Because usually filler words themselves are a symptom of a problem. They're not a problem themselves. And usually it's a problem because A, someone's speaking too fast. B, they don't have enough pauses when they're speaking. Or C, they just don't know what they're going to say next and are afraid of that silence as well. And I know for us extroverts, I'm an extrovert as well. Sometimes that silence can be so scary. Oh, if I have a pause, if I have a big silence, this is the place where people will judge me in my speaking, right? So it feels safer sometimes to have some of those filler words. So that's how we advocate for that baseline video to go. Because again, you see so much of that change over time. So that's one technique and one practice way to go. But usually after that baseline video, a practice for me every day will be popping three questions up and then recording myself as well. And the goal too is to speak for at least a minute. It's very easy to get a question that's like, oh, what's your favorite fruit? It is the mango. I like mangoes. That is why it's the mango. No, you want to go for a minute or so. And so another technique that we encourage folks to use when they start answering their impromptu questions is a structure that's called point, story, point. Mm -hmm. Most of the time when folks are answering a question, it becomes super short because they just don't know what to say, or it becomes super long because they don't know how to end it, right? That's where a lot of that rambling comes in, right? Or that repetition. Oh, I'm just repeating myself. I'm being very redundant in what I'm saying. So point, answer the question. And the funny thing is that second point is just saying that same sentence again. So you already know how you're going to start, how you're going to end. And then in the middle, that story, right? It doesn't have to be a, a long personal story. It doesn't have to be too winded, oh, long winded. It can be a story. It could be an example it could be an analogy as well, right? So if I, was got, if I was given the question, if you could speak any other language than the language you're speaking right now, which language would it be? I would say the language that I would love to speak would be Hindi. One thing that I did during the pandemic was I watched pretty much every single Bollywood film that was on Netflix for most days. Some I've watched four or five times, and I always have the subtitles on in English. I would love to be able to sing the songs, be fluent in the language, and even connect with a lot of my friends who also know Hindi. So that's why the language I would speak instead of English would be Hindi. You see you have that structure there. Maybe that wasn't exactly a minute long, but you see how having something there makes you feel so much more comfortable and confident because you know how you'll end and about how long you'll speak. Yeah. You land the plane very quick, like not abruptly. That's one, honestly, I never, I never knew that that's what it was called, but that's one of the things I did start to learn to do better is because I would just say something and be like, and thank you. Like I had no smooth. Mm. Ending. So I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that reiteration rather than some awkward. Thank you. I'm going to finish off with solidifying that point. I like that. So, I got a curious question. So with these base videos, are you just like putting them in a Google folder and dating them and then just randomly look at them? Like, how, what's the structure? I love this idea. I might, I might jock that a little bit, but like, how do you like, you know, this is like, this is like you getting your reps. This is you getting your exercise. That's you what we say. We say getting your reps. 
getting your reps. So how do you, yeah, how do you, how do you, you know, organize your reps? Yeah. Organizing the reps and that accountability again is so key. So what we have our clients do is post their reps, post their homework videos for feedback in a Facebook group. So we have a private Facebook group for the speaking Academy and that's where our clients post their videos. And that's where Yasser and I provide both text or video feedback based on their speaking. And again, we will give feedback on a lot of aspects of their speaking, but we only quote unquote judge them based on the one thing they're focusing on. So we'll have coaching calls and we'll have curriculum calls. And during our coaching calls, when they're practicing and they're learning as well, we'll say, okay, you're working on your assertiveness. Okay, you're working on slowing down. Okay, you're working more on your pauses. And so we know what the clients are working on. We predominantly give more feedback related to what they're working on, but we also let them know what else we notice so that that could be the next thing we work on. That can be their, their number one focus for the next week. And so when we have that accountability and those continuous reps, like you said, it makes sure that as each week, week passes by, we're not working on the same issue. Oh, you have a lot more assertiveness in your speaking. Let's start working on storytelling or let's start doing a lot more practice similar to the types of Q&As you have at work. Oh, I love it. All right. When was uh, a moment where the light bulb went off and you were like, I'm in my flow state. Like, this is something I enjoy doing. I'm, I'm, yeah, you know, obviously you're, you know, there's no perfection, but you're really enjoying it though. You're enjoying, uh, I love that you're enjoying the journey of it. Like when, when did that click, uh, particularly for you? When I first started this with the officer <laughs> and working with someone who not only won a dozen competitions, who's not only done this for so many years in a more formalized way, I felt a lot of imposter syndrome. And actually Yasser's the one who reminded me that as someone who's worked as a career coach for five years or five or more years, that meant that I have five years of professional communication experience, like teaching folks interviewing, which we work with a lot of our clients on interviews as well. And so I'm able to provide that support too. So he supported me a lot with that. But I think the moment where it clicked and I felt like I don't need to carry this weight of imposter syndrome. I know what I'm doing. I know how to build more skills as well. I know that this is a continuous journey was this past month. Yasser went back to Pakistan to visit his family for the first time in about six years or so. So he was out of the of Canada for about three months, three weeks, as I mentioned. And during those three weeks, he sometimes had issues with like his internet and he wasn't planning on coaching for the most part. He wanted to spend th almost all of that time with his family. And I totally understood that. There's a lot of food that he's been missing for a long time. And I was like, you go eat that food, you hang out with your family. So I took on the coaching calls for those three weeks. And I remember the first call, we had a new client there, the person I brought into the program, and a couple of our previous clients who'd been with us for about six weeks or so. And I hosted the call. Ironically, someone who teaches impromptu speaking, I have to be good at it because I'm always given so many random questions and so many really great questions that I have to think on the spot confidently to answer. And I hosted that session on my own. It was about about the length of our usual sessions, about two hours or so, really focusing and diving deep and doing a lot more of those reps live. And after the session, Yasser asked me, okay, how did it go? How did it feel? And I was like, I think I did okay. I think I did well. And he actually went and watched the session himself. And after he watched the session, he said, you need to stop saying you think you did well. If you truly felt like you did well, you did well. Also, you can do this on your own now. You're going to have your own coaching call on your own in our sessions. I host my own. You host your own. We host one together. You have this. You've got this. And that feedback and evaluation from him, as well as beginning to change my language around my own coaching, that session went really great. I did a great job. I didn't anticipate this was going to happen, and this is how I navigated it, versus well, I hope, I think, I don't know, it could be, right? A lot of those 
really doubting phrases. I don't doubt how good of a coach I am. And honestly, I think I'm surprising myself and surprising Yasser so much because I've picked it up way faster than we both expected. I love it. So I, I would say my my last question is, you know, there's different modes. I, I know I get some, I get a little bit of juice. Uh, honestly, I get a little bit more juice in person talking rather than virtual talking. Mm. Um, I think that call and response, uh, you know, recently I, I went and talked to a high school spoke to like 500 kids. Wow. And when I did it, you know, if I say something and say, how y'all feeling today? And they say, good, you know, you get juiced up because you can feed that energy. Um, have you, in your coaching, have you taken this public speaking and gotten some in-person engagements? And if so, do you also believe like me, there's a difference between a virtual public speaking engagement and a in-person speaking engagement? Yeah. I haven't done an in-person speaking engagement in quite a while. Even at the University of Florida, almost all of the presentations I gave were virtual. I think I gave about three or four in person, but that was like in the last few months of my employment there. There is definitely a big difference between in person and virtual speaking. I think one of the biggest differences and one of the ones I'm the most excited to use, right, and really show that capacity in is stage presence, mm -hmm. right? being able to truly use space. And you can still do that virtually, right? You can designate the space on the left of you virtually for the past, the right of you for the future. One thing I realize that a lot of folks think is a no-no, it just seems like you can't do it, is when you have your webcam on, you're looking at yourself, you're looking at your video feed, your hands can move past where the video feed is. You can go out of the literal box that Zoom or WebEx or whatever puts you in and you can gesture wide. You can gesture as big as you would maybe nor normally or more naturally in person as well. I think one of the things about in-person speaking that tripped me up a little bit more than I wanted it to would be that I would look to the audience and I would try to find an ally in the audience, right? I'd try to find someone who was nodding, someone who seemed energetic, someone who seemed interested. And that often actually made, that often inhibited my speaking in a way because I was looking out for those people who were supporting and celebrating, but not everyone does that in an audience, right? Someone can still be grossly involved in listening and they don't speak up or they don't move around. Or they don't show as much on their facial expressions or their body that they're engaged. And that also hampers your eye contact in person, right? Because you're maybe sharing it with like five different people when you should be dedicating a sentence per person, right? So that people feel more connected and you actually start building that interest in your speaking because other people feel like you're speaking to them, not just maybe the select four or five who maybe or are always excited when someone's speaking in person. So I would love to speak in person again. I've really enjoyed it as well. I think people think I'm taller than I am when I'm on Zoom and I'm not. I'm a little bit shorter <laughs> than people expect me to be, which is pretty fun. But I think with virtual speaking as well, you have to balance Virtual speaking when you have the gallery view and mm. virtual speaking when you're on webinar. That is the trickiest right there is when you can't see anyone and you just have the chat and it's just you and you are the energy for the talk. And maybe you expand upon the, some of the energy you notice in the chat, but you know you have to be the one who's really leading it and engaging as much as possible. And in some ways, using a little bit more of that entertainment mentality, making sure that you are bringing people in based on your enthusiasm. Yeah, I don't know. I ain't gonna lie though. I don't like webinar because I definitely yeah. like to see some faces. Um, but I definitely utilize chat too to get me some juice. Mm -hmm. I think I think the main thing about getting juice is, you know, there's energy, uh, rep yeah. like, reciprocity, right? Like I still, I, I like the thing about allies, but I definitely try to scan the room and look around. But but there, there is there is some kind of quality, uh, innate human being quality of interaction and connecting, mm -hmm. like almost a, it's almost like a spiritual thing too. Like that's why people do it in churches, right? They say, "Can I get an amen?" And then someone say, "Amen." They get the preacher, you know, like you get yeah. that call and response. There's nothing like it, you know. Um, and so, 
I don't know. I, I definitely, I definitely want to hone in both. And I definitely think there is a, a appropriateness to, you know, public speaking on video because we have to embrace technology. But I think there's also this point where I think that as a skill set, we, you know, to be a jack of all trades, a, you know, you got to get some of those a variety of reps, right? Like a variety yes. of scenarios. And so definitely getting comfortable when you can't see the audience webinar, getting comfortable when you see the boxes, getting comfortable where you see a uh, hundred people in the audience and you just got to get these different levels because mm -hmm. there are unique experiences. And I think that, you know, kind of having that, that, that mindset. All right. Well, I lied. I said that this was very informal, but I definitely <laughs> have a part of my show called shot for shot, mm -hmm. at which point you get to ask me any random question and I get to ask you any random question. Do you want to go first? Or I'll go first. Ooh, how about you go first? Just so I can pop in my head some of those impromptu right. questions. So you're from, the, you're, you're from the Berg, but you moved to Florida. Tell us, you know, just anecdotal, what was some main differences between the Florida life and the Berg life, Pittsburgh life? Yeah. Well, fun fact, I actually am originally from Texas. And so oh, living in Florida was very similar climate to living in South Texas as well. I would say some of the biggest differences between Pittsburgh and Florida, of course, naturally you're going to think the weather, right? And I recently started jogging. I started jogging maybe like six months ago or so. And it's very easy to do in a location where, you know, the weather is mostly going to be dry, mostly going to be warm. The, where you're running is flat, for the most part here in Pittsburgh, there's all the sidewalks are all jumbled up. It's I always have to make sure I'm not going to trip on something. And I always have to double check what the weather is for that day before I go out jogging, just to make sure that I'm not running into a thunderstorm. That's definitely a big one. When I think about Florida, I think about how before I moved, many people warned me or mentioned to me about gators right? A lot of people made jokes about me eating gator meat or gator sandwiches, which is extra level because I'm vegan, don't even eat any other meat. So why would I eat that? But one time I was on my scooter. So Gainesville is pretty known for having those motorized scooters, like the 50cc ones. I was driving on 34th and it was about three lane road. I was on the right most lane because I was driving slower than most people, 50 cc scooter. And I see ahead of me a gator crossing from the sidewalk, from the grass next to the sidewalk, right into the right lane of traffic that I was in. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is a real life gator I'm seeing right in front of me on the road that I'm in. How do I navigate this? And I knew I couldn't go into the left lanes because there were a bunch of cars going way faster than me. So I remembered this adage that my mother taught me growing up, which was, if you're about to get into a scrape in your while driving, it's safer to drive faster to get out of it than slower and then get into it. I don't know statistically whether that's true or not, but every single time I've sped up, whether biking or on a scooter or in a car, I was able to get out of the potential accident. So what I did was I leaned my scooter as left as possible as I could in that lane. I sped up as fast as I could, which I believe was probably 35 miles per hour. Again, not the fastest vehicle in the world. And I tucked my right foot into the left side of the scooter just in case and i scooted past that gator and it feels extra ridiculous saying it now it felt extra ridiculous it happening at all but you don't have those things happen in, P in pittsburgh i'll say that no oh, man gator you know that's what the florida gators you know what i'm saying <laughs> Exactly. I I, yes, I I don't know if Gatorade would have helped me at all. Maybe even go faster, but it was it was tricky. Uh, that's great. Okay, what's your question for me? Question for you. Let's see. I would love to hear if you like to dance, and if you do, what type of music you like to dance, or what styles. All right. So, um, you know, I am breaking a stereotype that I am a a, a man of color, a black man with no rhythm. Um, uh, but I love dancing anyway, regardless, I like to dance. 
Um, I don't know. I mean, I just like any move, music that moves me. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's times I literally have the most eclectic taste in music. Um, I like I like the stuff that people listen to now. I mm-hmm. like listening to soul music. I like listening to Motown. Um, just recently, when I moved into this new home, I took all my dad's, um, well, not all my dad's, but a large collection of my dad's vinyl records. And then I moved in with my in-laws as well, my father-in-law. And mm-hmm. so I took his vinyl records. And so I have a little vinyl record collection and I just randomly like, I don't even look, I go any, mini mighty mo and I put it in. I love so, that. So I've been listening to things like Prince, Purple Rain, to like Willie Nelson, <laughs> to like the Beatles, to like Earth, Wind and Fire. I mean, just the most random records. You know, my dad had the uh, the old bad, you know, Michael Jackson, mm-hmm. I mean, some real classics. So, and then when I'm listening to music, I don't know, I hit the two shuffle, you know, the little shuffle and dance to myself but you know uh, i like dancing with my wife you know partner dancing one style of dancing i always want to try and i need to get put on to it uh was chicago step have you heard of that i How haven't do, like step in the name of love like you know obviously you know even though r kelly's cancel whatnot um there's a there's a style of dance called chicago step if you google it it's really it's 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 been meant in chicago but it's a it's a definitely it's a partner dance it's a lot of spins, a lot of like, you know, one, two steps. Um, and one of my good friends, her name is Shay. Uh, 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 she's one of my high school buddies. She is like legit uh, a pro at Chicago Step. I mean, like she does competitions and stuff down in um, Norfolk. But um, that's one thing I did say once life is normal. I said, Shay, take me because, you know, it's, it's beginner level. Like uh, yeah. Chicago Step has like very advanced dance. Like it's for all ages. So there's people like older, older people that don't, you know, are not as mobile, but they are really good with moving their partner and swinging their par- partner. And then there's people that are like younger that have more footwork. So it's a wide range of skill set. Yeah. And I was like, Shay, please teach me how to do some Chicago step. So I'm going to send this episode to Shay at the very end and say, just listen to this part while I talk about Chicago step, but <laughs> that's going to be the style of dance. Uh, I want to learn. I want to try it out, especially because it's a partner thing. Yeah, I try it with my wife. Um, it, it is very chill. It's I think if you look up Chicago Step too, it's like real like it's not fast. It's like you you're really focusing on like spinning people and stuff. So it looks a lot of fun. So that sounds super fun. So that's it. You know, I love all kinds of music. I like dancing. I like to turn up. I like to you know dance off rhythm. Did a little two step and bounce a little bit. But I definitely formalized stepping. I want to try uh, Chicago Step. You know, that'd be fun. Yeah, definitely do so. And Shay, get him on it. Yeah. So this has been a great episode. And uh, now is the part of the show that is organized. I would love you to share uh, shout outs and plugs. So shout outs means anyone you want to show love to anyone and, um, you know, shout them out, show them love. And then plugs, plugs will be anything that you want the listeners to be aware of, how they can contact you, get in touch with you, and then other things that you're working on, at which I'll make sure to follow up with you at the end of this and put it in the show notes so that whoever listens to this episode can check those out. So shout outs and plugs. Stay yes. Busy. The first person I'd like to shout out to is the person who's listened to every single podcast, every single live, every single webinar I've hosted in the last five years. And that is my mother. Hi, mom. Thank you so much. I know you're listening to this now and you love the shout outs as well. So this one's for you as all of them are for you. And any feedback of yours, I'll definitely take because my mom gives me public speaking feedback too, which is very humbling and very necessary sometimes. She's like, you say yeah too much. And I was like, last five minutes, I think I said yeah five times. So good call, mom. And another person (laughs) that I'll shout out to as well is someone I've been talking about quite a bit today, which is Yasser Khan. Because in all aspects of our relationship working as he he is my business coach, he is my friend, he is my business partner as well. He's always encouraged me to push more forward, has always encouraged me to build up my skills and has always told me that I have so much to provide and that my inner confidence really needs to match that outer confidence that I portray to other folks, that once I have that match together, that not only am I unstoppable, but that we're unstoppable together in helping people and helping people, not just again, 
not have ums and uhs, help people get rid of a fear that they've had their entire life of speaking up, of showing up, and of being remembered and recognized in their organizations, which sometimes is that fear of success. All right. I love it. And so how can people get in contact with you on some things that you want to plug? Yes. Folks can contact me on LinkedIn. So Sammy Walker, you can find me there, public speaking coach. I'm also on TikTok at Speak Y'all, enjoying the TikTok journey as well as definitely new to me. And we'll include this in the show notes, as you mentioned, Phil, but we do have a one year of free training, free public, free public speaking training. This is a newsletter that goes out with tips regard and tips and exercises related to public speaking. So folks can work on this in their own home, start building a habit the next day. I love it. I'm definitely going to put that in there uh, for the listeners. And maybe, you know, honestly, I should be taking advantage of this myself. So, hey, you might have a new person. So thank you so much, Sammy. I really enjoyed having you. I'm really glad that we connected and you were actually open to this. So Positive Filter listeners, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a family member or friend. Sharing positivity is how we get this podcast off the ground. If you also want to leave a voicemail for the podcast, please call the hotline, which is 571-336-6560. That's 571-336-6560. Sometimes I take the voicemails and put them on the episode. So please shoot it up. And then also uh, just, you know, hit that like, subscribe, uh, rate, because the more you do that, it elevates the show. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for joining us on Positive Filter and have a good day. Thank you for listening to Positive Filter, a podcast that focuses on family, friends, career, with a little self-help along the way. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your family and friends and like the Facebook page, Spreading Positivity of Movement. Thanks for listening.